Well, good morning, everyone. I normally have to ask you guys to repeat that. I appreciate the energy this morning. So we're going to invite you guys to stand as you're able and join us as we begin our worship set here this morning. As we do that, we just want to uh, take a moment and just, uh, just revel in the fact that we get to serve a God, a God who is greater, a God who is bigger and stronger than anything we could possibly imagine. And uh, we just want to lift our voices in song to him here this morning. he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If we are in the family of God here this morning, it tells us that if God is for us, who can be against us? Nothing in this world can be against us because the God that we serve, our God, is greater. Greater, 
for reaching the region project. Um, my name's Terry Crutney. I'm one of the elders here. My privilege to bring some prayer requests to you. Uh, first of all, Jack Bart um, had a fall this week, but he is doing better. Um, and we're thankful that Marg has... Uh, 
had good health this week as well. And Mary Helen Wright and Eric, we want to continue to pray for them. Um, pray for peace for them and pray that uh, perhaps Mary Helen would have uh, small moments of joy through the day as well. And finally for Marguerite Rutan, uh, good news that she's moving in with her uh, nephew tomorrow and she'll have uh, PSW help, personal uh, support worker, two times a day for seven days a week. So that's good news. And we want to thank Debbie Devitt for all her work in helping that to happen. As far as reaching the region goes, normally I'm a numbers guy, but uh, I'll quickly mention that we're at 516,000 and change, and so 43% a goal. But I don't want to talk about numbers this morning. I want to enc encourage you about uh, a person. And that is, uh, look, I'm from the GTA. I moved here from the GTA. And the GTA is quite a bit different than Northumberland County, isn't it? Uh, I found that out. And um, the GTA is so new. I lived in, in Ajax. And the oldest thing there was the old munitions, munitions factory smokestack that was like 40 years old. I remember thinking, wow, that's really old. And then I moved to Northumberland County. <laughs> And it's quite a different experience. And, but the one thing that was different to me, I noticed, is that I was involved in a couple of church builds there, uh, new buildings, and you know, with the big foyers and the high ceiling and the <laughs> kind of semicircular setup. <clears throat> so that was quite a bit different uh, than coming in here. And um, the important thing is you get one chance to make a first impression. And I remember back in the days when 35 of us met, that included kids, we had a vision to build a building. Don't ask me how we were going to afford it. But we did, and through sacrificial giving. And a guy named Dan came one day. He had a Roman Catholic background. I didn't know him, but he was a, an executive in a business and a name of a company you would immediately recognize. And his career path was going like this. And Dan was not a Christian. And he told me later, uh, told a, a group of men in a, in a sermon, that uh, when he gave his testimony, he said he walked into the building, and the first person he saw was me. Now, that was frightening. <laughs> I was holding, just greeting on the door, holding one of my four kids. I'm not sure which one. And I supposedly, I don't even remember, smiled at him and said, welcome, good morning. And he said to me later, and said to this group, that when he walked up, he wanted the peace that that guy had in his life. How he knew that from me, scrambling, probably scrambling to get to church with four kids, I don't know. But that shows the miracle that can happen when a Dan walks through our building in a few years' time when this is done. Because Dan went on to be a good speaker. He went on to be an elder. He went on to be on the board of World Vision. And the most important gift that God gave him was the gift of mercy and the gift of giving. He helped us with a couple of expansions that we did and a new build. But he also helped out in ways that very few people know. And I'm going to share something with you today that very few people in the world know. I happened to find out one of our couples with three young kids, I think it was, the husband died, heart attack. And uh, there was a problem with the mortgage insurance, the life insurance on the mortgage. Uh, it wasn't going to, they weren't going to cover it. So this family was going to have to, I don't know what, move away, whatever, nobody knows. And Dan sat down and wrote a check, not tax deductible. He wrote a check with a lot of zeros and paid off that mortgage. And so the family stayed. Little did I know that one of those kids would grow up to be my future son-in-law. So you see, you never know who's going to walk through those doors when we finish this build. And it's not about... Um, the height of the foyer, it's not about the physical building, not doing it for the pastors, the elders, not even doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the Dan that's going to walk through the door and how he may impact your life in the future. Let's go to prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he has saved us and has redeemed us. Father, we pray for Jack Bart this morning and Pray, Father, that you would help him to continue to recover from his fall. We pray for Mary Helen Wright and Eric, that you would grant them peace by 
day and perhaps moments of joy as well, even in difficult times. Uh, we thank you for Margaret Rutan <clears throat> being able to move in with her uh, nephew. We just thank you that she's uh, going to have some help with personal support worker. And Father, we pray for a Reaching the Region program that people will give sacrificially, not for the leadership, not for the pastors, not even for themselves, but for the Dans of the world who will walk through and not only change uh, their lives, but change the lives of the people we come in contact with. So, Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We commit all this to you in his name. Amen. Good morning. Feels like it's been a while since I've been up here. It's good to be back up here. And uh, I'm excited this morning, and you should be excited as well. We start today into a new series. And it's a book that often is overlooked in Scripture, but one that God has some profound things to say to us. It's not an easy book, so each Sunday as you come, you know, buckle up, and we will dive deep and, and understand what God's message is for us. But God longs to speak to you through it, so would you pray with me as we start this morning? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you wrote it to us as your followers. Father, help us to open our ears to the message that you would have for us today and in the weeks ahead through this book. May we hear from you each week, and may we hear from you today and know what it is that you would have us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. On a dark night about 100 years ago, a Scottish missionary couple found themselves surrounded by cannibals intent on taking their lives. They were in their house. That night in terror, they fell to their knees, they prayed for God's protection. And as they prayed, they could hear the savages outside, they could hear the cries and the, sh the shouts. All night long, they expected them to breach the door at any moment. But then as the sun began to rise, to their astonishment, the natives retreated into the forest. They were confused, but they were undeterred, and so they simply continued to do their missionary work. About a year later, after the chief of the tribe was converted, the missionary asked the chief why he and his men had kill, hadn't killed them that night. The chief responded by asking, well, who were all those men that were with you? But uh, there were no men with us. It was just me and my wife, he said. But the chief started to argue with him. There were hundreds of tall men in shiny garments with drawn swords circling about your house, so we couldn't attack you. The story, it's become a famous story of angels protecting God's people. So famous that you might have heard of it before. But is it a one-of-a-kind story? You might think so, but it's actually one of many similar accounts. In fact, similar stories are so frequent that one has to wonder whether God has some sort of special angel detachment, a missionary protection platoon, if you will. Whether that's the account of Norwegian missionary Mary Monson, who served in northern China. She tells that one day, looting soldiers surrounded their missions compound, but never entered. A few days later, they learned why when a marauder explained to them that they, when they were about to enter the compound, they saw tall soldiers with shiny faces on a, the high roof of the compound. Or the story that comes from the Rift Valley Academy back in 1956. There during the, the Mau Mau uprising in East Africa, a band of roving Mau Maus came to the village of Lori. They surrounded the village. They killed everyone in it, about 300 women, children. They killed everyone there. Well, not three miles away from that village is the Rift Valley Academy, a private school where missionary kids were. Immediately after leaving Lori, they came with their spears and their bows and their arrows and their clubs to the school. The students and the staff, they could see the torches approach through the darkness and watched in horror as they encircled the academy and cut off all avenues for escape. The band began to advance on the school, shouting louder and louder. Then inexplicably, when they were close enough to throw their spears, they stopped. And they retreated and then ran into the jungle. Well, eventually the army captured them and they were put on trial. During the trial, the judge asked one of them, on that particular night, did you kill all the inhabitants of that town of Lori? Yes, he said. Well, well why didn't you complete the job, he asked the, the man. Why didn't you finish the job when you went to the school? The man explained, we were on our way to attack and destroy all the people of the school, but the closer we came, all of a sudden, when we got close enough to throw our spears, the, the, around the school were hundreds of huge men dressed in white with flaming swords, and we became afraid and ran to hide. 
story after story of angels showing up in miraculous ways of people's encounter with powerful angels. And truthfully, whether it's those stories or others, our world has a fascination with angels, doesn't it? We see it in how frequently they show up in TVs and movies and, and how often jewelry and figurines seem to feature them. And yet, despite how great they are, how powerful they are, and how fascinated we might be by them, in our passage we find out today that they all pale in comparison to Jesus. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me over to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. As we start into this book, let me give you some context. Unfortunately, when we come to the book of Hebrews, less is known about this book than almost any other. For one, we don't know who wrote it. Some, they expect the Apostle Paul wrote it, but the Greek writing, it doesn't really read like Paul, nor does it fit the format that Paul normally used. Others, they suggest that maybe it was Apollos or, or Barnabas or Luke. After all, whoever wrote it seemed to be closely linked with Timothy and mentions him. But there's problems with each. While Luke wrote other books, he, he came from a Gentile background, and Hebrews, well, it seems more likely to have been written by someone immersed in Judaism. Barnabas is an attractive option since he was a Levite and the priestly status he had would explain many of the references in the book to priestly issues. But outside of that, there's no real evidence that he wrote it. The eloquence of the letter, it could point to Apollos, but then again, there's no real evidence. Origen, an ancient theologian, concluded, who wrote this epistle is known only to God. We just don't know. Nor are we told who are they writing to. Sure, given the amount of Old Testament quotes, it would seem likely that they were writing to those that had a significant amount of knowledge of the Old Testament. So one would naturally think of the Jews. And given that they quote those Old Testament quotes from the Septuagint, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you could surmise that they were likely Hellenistic Jews, those that lived outside of Israel. Now, the greeting to those in Italy, from those in Italy at the end of the book, may also point in that direction. But while that would fit, especially since the book alludes to current and future persecution, something we know that the Jews in Rome were experienced under Emperor Claudius in the 40s and about to suffer under Emperor Nero in the 60s, nothing is certain. We just don't know. Nor are we told when it was written. And so it only hints at a date. After all, the only indication of a date is that it seems to talk about the temple and the sacrificial system as if it's still being used. So likely it was written prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. But even that is speculation. One author wrote, Perhaps God did not reveal that date because with it we might read the book differently from the way the Holy Spirit has intended for us to read it. See, for some reason God didn't feel that any of that information was important enough to give us. But you know, regardless who wrote it, who it was written to and when it was written, what is clear is that it was written to Christians to encourage them not to fall away from their faith, to not return to their former Jewish beliefs. And truthfully, it's hard for you and I to really understand how difficult it would have been for that first generation of Jewish Christians to put their faith in Jesus. We can only imagine the kind of arguments that unbelieving Jews would have used to dissuade them. No doubt they would have pointed out that Jesus was just a man, a carpenter's boy no less, from a backwater little town. They might have suggested that Jesus was just one of the many zealous leaders of his day. Besides that, they would have pointed to his death. Certainly the Messiah, he wouldn't have been humiliated by dying on a cross. Now, Jesus, he must have just been a man that got carried away, followed by a bunch of fanatics that made outlandish claims about him. The pressure on these new Christians to convert back to Judaism would have been overwhelming, especially since... It was their belief in Jesus that led to them being pushed out of the Jewish community and opened them up to violent persecution. And no doubt, many were considering, reconsidering their faith. And so the author wrote to encourage them to stay true to their faith and to remind them of what the, the truth of what they believe. Well, it's with that goal that the author starts his book by focusing on a topic that is at the very center of our faith. If you would, you can follow along as I read, starting in verse 1. The author writes this, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also He created the world. 
He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purifications for sin, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be my son to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of brightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, lay the foundation of the earth in the beginning. All the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are they not the angels ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? You know, often when we talk about Jesus, we jump straight to what He did without speaking of who He is, don't we? But not here. No, the author of Hebrew, he starts his book with one of the most profound chapters in the entire Bible as he focuses his attention solely on the person of Jesus. So much so that descriptor after descriptor seem to cascade over each other like water tumbling down into a valley. In fact, in the first four verses alone, there are at least ten weighty topics which span from heaven to hell, from eternity past to eternity future. The list of them, if I were to list them for you, they they read like part of the table of contents for the chapter on the study of Christ in a systematic theology textbook. But you know, amidst all those themes, three seem to rise to the top as things the author wants you and I to know about Jesus. There are three truths here that I want you to get this morning that will help you not to waver in your faith. So notice the first, that Jesus is a superior revelation. That Jesus is a superior revelation. Like someone telling a story, maybe one of your kids' story, a long time ago in a distant land. The author here, he, he places the account of Jesus within the context of history, stating that long ago, at many times and in many ways, God had spoken to his people. Note that the author, he wanted his readers to re- know that Jesus, he hadn't come out of nowhere. He, he wasn't an outlier. It, he wasn't like he was the first one to carry a message from God. No, and say God had been speaking to his people for centuries. God had spoken through the prophets and sometimes through priests and angels and even at one time through a donkey. Sometimes through dreams, other times through visions, inspiring scripture and calling his people to follow him. Through it all, God had shown, he'd revealed his character and shared his will. You see, it's just that it wasn't Moses who spoke in Genesis or or David who wrote the Psalms or Jeremiah or Ezekiel that penned on their own the, the books that bear their names. No, God had spoken through them. It was His Word. The Apostle Peter put it this way, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul would write that all Scripture is God breathed. In other words, it's all from God. But you know, as great as that was, while one would be hard-pressed to find a greater group of spiritual giants than the prophets who wrote the Old Testament, they and their writings, they all pale in comparison to the Son of God coming to this earth in Jesus. Never before had God revealed Himself in such a distinct way. Never before had God given such a clear word to us. The Apostle John, he gets at this in the first chapter of his Gospel, stating that the Word, that Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No doubt it's why Jesus would say, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. And Jesus, the world experienced God like they had never had before. Sure, before they could see God's handiwork, 
God in his handiwork of creation, but in Christ they met the very one who was not only there when everything was created, but had created everything. Throughout their history, they had witnessed, they had experienced God's compassion, but in Jesus they saw compassion beyond compare. Through the prophets, they had read of God's character and his nature, his attributes, but in Jesus, these were all on display for them to see. Ezekiel portrayed the glory of God, but Christ reflected it. Isaiah expounded the holy righteousness of God, but Christ manifested it. Jeremiah described the power of God, but Jesus displayed it. See, there's just a far cry from having someone describe something to you or someone to you and having seen them or seen it for yourself. I remember years ago, back when I was a preteen, I got a chance to go to Greece and we went to Athens. And I had read in the, in the book of Acts how the Apostle Paul had preached in the, in the Areopagus there. And, but when I stood on the little hill where he spoke from, where they say he spoke from anyways, and felt the shadow of the Acropolis over me and got a glimpse of what that would have been like, that passage of Scripture, which had been described to me numerous of times, suddenly came alive. I could put myself in his shoes. Like someone who's read a, about a waterfall but then gets to visit it. I remember the first time I, I got to visit Victoria Falls in Zambia, with, with a width of over 1,700 meters. Those in Zambia, they call it Moziotunya, the smoke that thunders. It sounds impressive, but to feel the mist, to hear the thunder miles away, was far more impactful than just being told about it. You see, there's a big difference between hearing or reading about something, between listening and experiencing. And in Jesus, the people weren't just hearing about God, they were hearing from God, and God was on display for them. There's a a scene from Jesus' life that illustrates this greatly. In Matthew 17, we're told that Jesus takes three of his closest disciples up onto the mount. There they see him transfigured in glory and and speak with Moses and Elijah. Peter, one of the disciples that is there, they propose building a tabernacle for each one of those giants, spiritual giants. But just then a glory cloud envelops them in brightness and the voice of God says, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. When the disciples, they they rise from their terror, they don't see either Moses or Elijah. They only see Jesus. One commentator writes, the glory associated with Moses and Elijah was so eclipsed by the infinitely greater glory connected with Christ that they faded from view. Jesus was infinitely greater. Now, it wasn't that what the prophets had said wasn't true. It, It wasn't that it wasn't, What they had said wasn't important. It it wasn't that they should discard or that we should discard the Old Testament. No, we should read it and study it and follow it. It it was simply that Jesus revealed God in a way the Old Testament could only allude to or point to. In fact, Jesus came to fulfill it. No, no, people, they didn't always get that during Jesus' life. In fact, in John 14, when Jesus is preparing his disciples for his future death and his disciples are distraught, Jesus said to them, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. But Philip said to him, Lord, show us God the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I not been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority, But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Not a few chapters before, Jesus had said to a group of Jews, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews were confused and so they said to him, you're not yet 50 years old and have seen Abraham? Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus wasn't just claiming to be alive before Abraham. No, by saying before Abraham was, I am, as opposed to before Abraham was, I was, he was claiming a kind of transcendence over time that only was true of God. At least that's how the Jews that were listening, that were there, understood it, as they immediately picked up stones to stone him. After all, if Jesus had just been claiming to be 2,000 years old, they could have dismissed him as insane. But when he claimed to be God, that was blasphemous in their eyes. Somehow, they understood his claim, but they failed to see that it was true, that the God they said they followed, the the God they said they revered, was on display before them in Jesus. 
in the second person of the Trinity. Here, the, the author of Hebrews, he puts it this way, writing that he, that Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God. And that, that phrase, it would have caused Jewish readers to think back to the Old Testament when the shining, visible glory of God was seen. His majesty was on display like it was in the book of Exodus. Don't miss it. The author is saying that when we look at Christ, we see most fully the glory of God. Over the book of Exodus, we come across a time when Moses asks to see God's glory. And God responds, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. But he said, you cannot see my face, for a man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. I don't know if you picked it up, but there God equates his glory, which Moses asked to see, to his goodness, to his true character. Well, in Jesus, in the Son, we see exactly that. We see God's goodness and character. In fact, so much so that Hebrews states that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. The author, he uses languages that would have been used as a a die that casts an image. You can think of uh, a press that would press a coin, the the die that would press and the coin. The die matches the imprint. In other words, when you see Jesus, you see the Father. That means when you see what Jesus is like, you know what God the Father is like. When you come to know how Jesus thinks, how He talks, how He relates to people, you come to know how God the Father thinks and talks and relates to people. Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father. Now, that doesn't mean that they are not distinct. John in his Gospel wrote, in the beginning was the Word, in the beginning was Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Distinct, with God, and was God, and yet one. Friends, do you want to know God? Look no further than the second person of the Trinity. Look no further than Jesus. Study Him. See how He acted. Listen to what He said in His Word. Consider what He thought and see God the Father. Here, the author of Hebrews, he desperately wanted the Jews of his days, Jews that were considering going back to the prophets to know that in doing so, they were turning their back on the greatest revelation God had given, a revelation of Himself and settling for something far less. And that just didn't make sense. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. They simply needed to remember who Jesus was and, and fix their gaze on Him. So that's not all the author wants to convey. No, not only was Jesus a superior revelation, But here we're told that Jesus has a superior status, that he has a superior status. It makes sense, really, when you stop and think about it. Well, the prophets worked for God. None of them had the status of God. In fact, neither did the angels. Something that the author here goes on to point out, asking whether Jesus ever spoke of an angel as his son. Now, the question is rhetorical, of course. The answer was obvious to the Jews. He had never done that. Still, let's be honest. Doesn't the passage leave, us, leave you asking questions? It, it did me. I mean, why all of a sudden does the author bring up angels? The whole thing seemed to come out of left field when I first read it. That is until I considered the context. You know, after all, the, the author, he's making a, a comparison, a lesser to greater comparison. And so to highlight how superior Christ is, how superior Jesus is, he picks one of the highest, most respected beings he could to compare him to. And angels, well, they fit the bill. Angels were revered by the Jews. Literature from the intertestamental period, that's a 400 years or so between the Old Testament and New Testament, sometimes called the Second Temple Judaism. Well, it demonstrates an intense focus on angels. People considered angels God's protectors and Israel's protectors, God's messengers. It was during that time that personal guardian angels, that notion arose. Well, no doubt it was that current fascination with angels that contributed to the author picking them to compare Jesus to. But not only that, some think that the believers who he's writing to were in danger of of compromising. That there was even pressure on them to, to declare that Jesus was just an angel. After all, for converted Jews, if they'd simply agree that Jesus was an angel, and perhaps even the greatest angel, but not God, 
the Jews would accept them back into the synagogue, the, the very community that they were a part of and no doubt missed. Besides, concluding Jesus was an angel wasn't like outright denying him. It wasn't like pretending they hadn't had a real experience with an exalted being. It, it was a seeming win for many. Truthfully, it doesn't take much for us to identify with that, does it? After all, even today, the world bristles when we say that Jesus is the only way. But if we say he is a way, one way among many, the world, it, it really doesn't care. The pressure is off. For them, simply cha- a simple change from the Son of God to angel and their suffering would end. So the author makes it clear, not only is Jesus not an angel, but Jesus is superior to them. Don't hear me wrong. That doesn't mean that angels are insignificant. Angels are mentioned over 160 times in the New Testament and over 100 times in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us they exist in vast number, that they're part of the heavenly throng that worship God. It tells us they're sent by God, sometimes invisible, and God opens people's eyes to see them. Other times they appear and are mistaken for men. Still other times they shine with light or, or have appeared as winged creatures. The accounts in the Bible show that they have incredible power. They defeat armies at times, deliver captives, give God's message to His people. In fact, so wondrous are angels that oftentimes when people, they show up to people, people fall down on their faces in fear and angels have to stop people from worshiping them. But it is that very thing, it is their greatness that makes the author's point here. Despite their power, despite the awe that accompanied them, the fascination the people had with them, with angels, Jesus is far better. In fact, Jesus is superior for another reason than Jesus has been given a superior name. Look at verse 4. It says this, Having become as much superior to the angel as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, you need to know, know that in Jewish thought, a name wasn't just a name. It, it revealed someone's nature. It expressed their, their rank, their dignity. And that was certainly the case when it comes to the name that was given to Jesus that of God's Son. Sure, at times, the angels collectively, they were called sons of God, just as man was. But no one was ever addressed the way that God the Father does Jesus as His Son. Quoting from Psalm 2, a a psalm that speaks of a king that will one day subdue the nations, but speaks of a, a descendant of David that is greater than any man could ever be. He declares it to be pointed to Jesus. Psalm 2, it reads this, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Of course, the one who sits in heaven is Jesus. The passage then goes on to say, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now, I can hear someone say, well, wait a minute. If Jesus is God in the flesh, how do we handle that? How do we handle when the, the author says, today I have begotten you, when God says of Jesus, today I have begotten you? Doesn't the word begotten indicate that at one point Jesus had a beginning? That he had a start? Doesn't First John tell us that Jesus is God? So if Jesus is the eternal Son of God, what do we make of this statement? Well, first, you need to know that it's probably better read as, today I proclaim you, my Son, my begotten Son. That it's more of a declaration of the truth than a new statement. So, what is the day he's talking about? Well, there are several times during Jesus' life when a heavenly voice was heard declaring Jesus to be God's Son. It happened when Gabriel spoke with Mary saying that the son she had would be the Son of the Most High. So, it could have been that day he was referring to. The same thing happened at his baptism. The voice of God was heard saying, this is my beloved Son. And again, at his transfiguration. It could be any of those, as Jesus was eternally begotten, not in the sense that he was born to, but in the sense that he proceeds from the Father and is the one that will inherit the kingdom. It's no different than declaring that Bryce is my son and will inherit my estate with my other kids. It's just a fact. So which declaration was he referring to when he said today? Well, I've had to guess it's none of those. After all, the Apostle Paul, when preaching a sermon, said, We bring to you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this He has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Paul equates being begotten with Jesus' resurrection. Romans 1 spells it out. Concerning His Son who was descended from David according to flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to Spirit 
of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, when God raised Jesus from the dead, He brought Him into His inheritance. His status as heir, as son, was shown to the entire world that was declared through His resurrection. So, regardless of whether that's the time or not, the point is clear. Jesus is the only son. The son the Old Testament pointed to. And as a son, He's the heir of all things and supreme. In fact, so superior is he that the author of Hebrew goes on to say that the angels worship him. Writing, and again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels worship him. Uh, truthfully, we don't know once again when the author is referring to. Some think that he's referring to when the son was presented to the angels immediately after he had created the angels. Others think it refers to Jesus' birth or the heavenly host singing at that time or, or his resurrection or in the future. The book of Revelation states that in the future, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, will be around the throne worshiping. So all are possible. But this we can be certain. The angels worship him because he's the firstborn, born, a term that is used to show that he'll inherit everything. Not that he was born. It's a term of status. But not only that can we be certain, we can be certain that they worship him as God. Since the passage he quotes from, in its original context, talks about the angels bowing down in reverence to Yahweh, to God the Father. The author's argument is clear. The angels worship Christ. It's not Christ who worships the angels. He is the firstborn, the eternal son. And as firstborn is the heir of all things, not them. Instead, while the angels are his servants, winds and flames of fire carrying out his purposes, sent out as his ministers, they are merely his servants. In other words, while they have servanthood, Jesus has sovereignty, as it is Jesus who's enthroned. He is the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father in the position of authority. He is the one on the throne. The one to whom God said, Your throne, O God, is forever. The scepter of your brightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Don't miss it. God the Father calls the Son, calls Jesus God, and uses that passage from Psalm 45 to do so. He also pictures him ruling with a royal scepter, ruling justly. A scepter was used to, to invite people to approach. It was waved to demand silence. It was an instrument of rule. And here we're told that he uses it to rule justly, and that that justice fills him with so much joy that it constitutes his anointing. Anointing that sets him above his companions. The author says, who share in his happiness. You know, later in the book of Hebrews, we'll find that those companions are those that share in his heavenly calling. They are you and I. The readers of this originally wouldn't have missed that. The 16th century catechism asks the question this, but why are you called a Christian? The answer it gives is this, because by faith I'm a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I'm anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a free conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterwards to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. Well, how encouraging must have that been to those that are waving their faith, that they were Jesus' companions and shared his anointing as king? It would have given them hope for the future, knowing that the pain of this life was only temporary, and they would one day rule with Christ. But not only that, it likely served to remind them that Jesus is king. Did you ever think about that? I mean, outside of Sunday when we sing that he's king. We say all the time in the church that Jesus is king. We say he's enthroned. We even have songs that say we have thrown him in our hearts. But you know, when we sing it, do you stop and think about it? Do you really believe it? If I'm honest, I hazard to guess that most of us really don't as much as we say it. Simply because if we did, if we really did, if we saw the picture of him as king that's being presented here, we saw him for who he is, as the one enthroned, the ruler of all, the sovereign king, then we would not only follow him, but would do so with reverence and a dedication that I rarely see. Over in Luke 14, Jesus approached by a crowd, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own wife, he cannot be my disciples. For whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. 
For what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate about whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus, a king, asks for a complete devotion. He asks for us to put him in front of our family, be willing to renounce everything for him. That's what following him as a king looks like. How many people really follow that way? Well, well, why? Why do people not follow that way? I believe it's because they haven't gotten a glimpse of who he is as king. But not only that, they haven't grasped what he goes on to quote here in Psalm 110, saying that Jesus' enemies will be his footstools. Reminding them and us that as king, one day every knee will bow to him and every tongue confess him and that all the angels will be in that number. Reminder that you got to think for those that were reading this, that were facing difficulties and persecution, would have hit home for them. As a reminder them that the persecution they faced didn't compare to their future and that those that persecuted them didn't compare to the one they were following. And truthfully, it's a reminder that should serve us well as well. After all, if Jesus is king and we are his servants, if he is sovereign and in control, the one we're accountable to, then the only person whose opinion matters is his. He's the only one we should follow. Like it or not, the degree you follow him or not reveals how cloudy or clear your view of him as king is. Well, Notice lastly, not only is he a superior revelation, not only does he have a superior status, but he has a superior nature. He has a superior nature. You know, sometimes when we read a passage like this, we get the impression that the only difference between an angel and Jesus is one of rank. I'll never forget one of the stories of my grandfather. It's probably my favorite story that he told me. He told me how he was teaching about armaments across from the Kingston base during World War II. And how it really bothered him. He wasn't an officer, but he was teaching officers. And it bothered him how at lunch, all the officers would go over to the base and go into the officer's mess and get a free lunch. But he had to bring a bag lunch. So noticing one older officer who always brought a lunch, one day he asked to borrow the officer's jacket. Putting it on, he strolled across onto the base and went into the mess. Throughout the meal, as he enjoyed his free meal, he, he thought it was strange that everyone was asking him about trench warfare. But he was young and cocky, so he just rolled with it. That is, until he looked down at his jacket and realized the reason, as on his jacket were a bunch of World War I ribbons, and he was in his 20s. They had figured it out. Well, sometimes we come to this passage and we read it, and it's as if Jesus and the angels are in the same category. It's just one outrakes the other. But nothing could be further from the truth. They're completely different categories. And the author gets to that point by referring to Psalm 102 and verse 10, where Jesus is seen as the eternal creator the one that laid the foundations of the earth. Now think about that for a moment. Our Savior set the world in motion. The beauty of the mountains, the the wonder of the desert, from the sloth to the elephant, the moose to the rat, every speck of dust in the universe, every atom, He crafted it, He made it. In fact, so powerful is He that He brought it all into being by His Word. He spoke it into being. The Apostle Paul in Colossians wrote, For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all were created through him and for him. Well, certainly if Jesus had spoken the galaxy into being, he could be counted on to keep us during our time of testing, to guide us in the face of adversity. If he could bring a universe that works into being, certainly he could control our destiny and provide for us. Unless you think, well, his power was just that one time. The author says he upholds the universe by the power of his word. That means if Jesus ever ceased to will the universe to exist, it would cease to exist. If you were to remove his hand, it would spin out of control. His power holds it all together. That is just how powerful he is. Over in Psalm 102, the psalmist, he laments on the weakness and decaying nature of life. He writes, For my days pass away like smoke. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But not Jesus. No, he is, as creator, he's eternal. While heaven and earth will perish, while creation will wear out like clothes, Jesus will remain. Now, on one level, that thought, it's a bit depressing. Our lives are that fleeting. But Psalm 102 closes with the assurance that because God is eternal, because He doesn't change, the children of His servants shall dwell secure. 
As God said in Isaiah 51, Lift up your eyes to heaven and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment. And they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever. And my righteousness will never be dismayed. In other words, when all of life seems lost, when hardships and, and even death await, when the worst calamities are on our doorstep, Jesus is someone we can trust. He is the eternal God, reigning in power, in whom we can find hope. Don't miss it. Here, the author, he doesn't want you to leave chapter 1 with a focus on angels. He, he doesn't want you to focus on the prophets. Instead, he wants you and I to be captivated, to be awestruck, dumbfounded, to be amazed by the wonder of our Savior and the God we worship. So much so that the thought of turning away would be seen for what it is, a senseless, a futile act. After all, if what the author says here is true, what could you possibly need that can't be found in Jesus? Do you need pardon for your sin? He made purification for it. Do you need to be made right with God the Father? Christ is at God's right hand interceding for you. Do you need strength to follow Him? From His heavenly throne, He sends resources, His angels to your aid, and His Spirit to guide you. Do you have troubles, difficult decisions to make, things that worry you, problems that make you anxious? Christ is enthroned in power and is sovereign and is in control. That means, as one author put it, that there is nothing you might face, nothing you might lack, nothing you might need in all your weakness and human frailty that is not found abundantly in Him who loves you and gave Himself for you and now reigns as Savior and Lord. Now, I don't know where you may be at today, but I do know this. Like it was for those that this was originally written to, for us, life, it can be hard. And it's just as easy for us to move our focus off of Jesus and put our eyes onto other things as it was for them. So we too need the reminder here to stop and gaze again and again on the face of Christ. We need to continually consider who He is, what He's done, and what He promises to do. Because the more we do so, the more we'll not only grow in our walk with Him, the more we'll not only live how we ought, allowing Him to, allowing who He is to shape who we are, but the more we'll be established in our faith to the point that regardless what comes, our eyes will be so fixed on Jesus and our hope so secure in Him that we can't be rattled or deterred and would never consider turning back. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank You for the picture that you paint here of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for every descriptor here. Help us to realize who you are and not just to acknowledge it, but to live in the truth of it. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close out our service this morning, we'll invite you to stand once again as you're able and join us. Heaven is 
bow with me as we close our service. Father, may that be the cry of our heart that we have decided to follow you and that would be no turning back. Lord, help us to be those that would be committed regardless what may come. And him who's able to do far more than we ever imagine or think according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go on, God bless.